Hello and welcome to Kidney Plugged In. Did you know that December 3rd is Giving Tuesday? Giving Tuesday is a global day of giving fueled by the power of social media and collaboration. This year, the Kidney Foundation's Giving Tuesday campaign highlights both the physical and the emotional burden of this life-threatening illness in the hidden scars of kidney disease. And on today's show, meet pre-transplant kidney patient Ava and her mom, Janine. Join us as we sit down with Janine in part one of a mini documentary series that will follow Janine along her journey to become a living kidney donor for her daughter, Ava. So stay with us because it's all next right here on Plugged In. She had been sick on and off for a month. We'd taken her to the doctors a couple of times and they deemed it was just a sore throat or it was just a cold. And it was actually December 27th. We decided to take her to Eagle Ridge and um, she was diagnosed in full renal failure and we were told that an ambulance would be coming and be taking her to Children's. My name is Janine and my daughter's name is Ava. She's 13 and she has chronic kidney disease. Ava was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease in 2011 when she was five and a half. During that month in December in 2011, she was experiencing having a cold, having a sore throat, having a sore tummy, she threw up. And then when we took her in on the 27th, um, they did a number of blood tests. They did a urine test, and her urine was the color of a glass of Merlot. And so we were then led to Children's and seen by a number of nephrologists um, that explained that we would be there for a while. And my first question was, what was a nephrologist? Because I didn't know a nephrologist from anybody else. So she had surgery to put in a dialysis tube uh, within two days of arrival. And then they started hemodialysis for two weeks. And then we learned how to do peritoneal dialysis at home. And that's a week long training in itself. And then we were, she was released. I say we because we went through it with her um, on February 13th. So when we went to Eagle Ridge Hospital, uh, we were taken in fairly right away. She had been very sick over the initial Christmas holidays. And so when we went in, they did the blood test and the person, the doctor that came in, um, didn't sugarcoat anything and said she is in full renal failure. And then literally behind her were two nurses and those nurses took care of one, took care of us and the other meaning her dad and myself, and then the other took care of her and getting her prepared for going in the ambulance and uh, catheter and that sort of thing. From our point of view, um, her dad um, kind of emotionally checked out, was over, very overwhelmed by it, and it was at that time that I realized, okay, I've got to, I've got to be listening for multiple ears here, and okay, okay, we need to do this, and we need to do that, and that's when um, Mama Bear took over. The unfortunate part of emotion sometimes is that you don't know how everybody's going to react, and so I had to choose, it didn't, I guess it chose me to be pragmatic, because her father and other family members became very emotional. And so I had to counterbalance that by being extremely pragmatic. And I think the emotion didn't come until much, much later. But the initial diagnosis, I had to be listening and had to be focused. Um, I don't think Ava had a clue. Um, I think she was feeling definitely ill enough. Um, we ended up finding out that the infection uh, to her kidneys, what caused her the, the renal failure, was uh, strep infection. 
and normally it would affect uh, children and adults in their throats um, and it went to her kidneys and so at, uh, at her worst her kidneys were damaged at 90 percent each and so hence they had to figure out what the next steps would be. There's certainly a lot of stressors that go along with having a health condition such as CKD, so um, things like uh, physical discomfort and pain, um, you know, interrupted sleep, all of those things that are happening in the body. There can also be side effects from medications, uh, frequent medical appointments that require people to miss work and school, so all of those are certainly stressors that can contribute to mental health challenges. There are also some direct impacts of the illness and treatment itself. So things like uremia, as toxins build up in the blood, there can be an impact on the brain. So, you know, attention, concentration, mood um, can all be particular challenges. There can also be other things that go along with CKD, like anemia, for example. So when people have low iron, they might feel more fatigued. Um, there might be a bit of an impact on their mood. Um, so all of those things put people at, at an increased risk for having some challenges with their mental health. With young children, um, these things can show up um, a little bit differently. So, you know, when we think about sort of um, going through the stages of development, the closer to adult they are, the more similar something like depression would look. So for a teenager, it might be quite similar to an adult. Um, for younger children, though, they oftentimes show stress through body symptoms. So we might see changes in their eating, we might see changes in their sleeping, um, those types of things. There might be some complaints of, of body pains or discomfort comfort and that can be a way of the young person expressing that something's the matter but they don't have the vocabulary yet to be able to say you know I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling low um, so we can see more of those body um, complaints. So I think it's important to think about sort of going back to the basics. So things like healthy eating, prioritizing enough time for sleep, um, getting exercise is a really critical piece, managing stress, reducing stress whenever possible, calling in your support system, seeing if there are some things in the course of your week that you could you know, give up for a period of time, doing things like yoga or meditation, whatever you do in your life to manage stress, anything that gives you relaxation. Relaxation. It can also be really helpful to connect with other people. So um, making sure that you reach out to your friends, your family, your support system. I think, you know, if, if those um, struggles like a low mood or anxiety go on for um, quite a period of time and it is getting in the way of day-to-day -day life, then it is time to think about asking for help and support. Um, so for adults, a really important person to start with would be your family doctor. Um, also your kidney care clinic team. When it comes to crisis services, it's also really important to know that those exist 24-7. So, um, you know, in your local area, there, there will be crisis services and crisis lines um, that can click in if someone really needs in the moment support. So for children, um, again, family doctors are a great source of information or a pediatrician um, and that's a really great starting place. For adults, uh, the Anxiety Canada website is a really great source of information. And actually, both for adults and for children, they have resources that are um, you know, really across the age span. The Canadian Mental Health Association website is another really great source of information. And then the other one specifically for children and youth is the Kelty Mental Health website. They have an amazing website. They also archive things like expert presentations, webcasts, things like that, and so that's another really great source of information around mental health broadly in young people.
So to get her to BC Children's, uh, the nurse basically told her father that he needed to go home, get a couple days worth of clothes to be changed for us, and he was to throw a few things in a bag for Ava, and we would likely be there two to four days. And um, then Ava and I went in the ambulance, two children, and were met by uh, she was she was a resident, and it was it was night, and her name was Dr. Kathy, and um, it wasn't till morning that we met um, the nephrologist, Dr. Colin White, Dr. Cherry Mammon, and Dr. Janice Dion, and um, after looking at her blood work and her creatinine being in the 800s, and her um, urea which are telltale signs of kidney disease, um, was quite high, and so they deemed that they needed to proceed and proceed fairly quickly. Um, the next steps that uh, she had to go through is after, it was our second day there at Children's, um, and we were taken into a room with Dr. Dion, Dr. Kathy, and I believe another resident, and it was just myself and her dad. And they spoke very clearly, slowly, and said, she's going to have to start dialysis, and we need to do something. Surgery was later that day, and they put in a dialysis tube into her stomach. To put the tube in was on, on day two, and they started dialysis on day three, and that lasted for close to two weeks that she was on hemodialysis at Children's Hospital in Vancouver. What I learned about my daughter is that um, she can, I mean, she's only five and a half, but she's calm, and um, she was getting all sorts of blood drawn, and I learned that she's a watcher. She watches blood being drawn. I can't stand the sight of blood, and, you know, I put my arm out and get blood drawn and she, she wants to watch, so. One of the many experiences that Eva went through um, was, because we were in the hospital for almost two months, is her interaction with the staff. Uh, we got to know the staff very well, and when you're living 24-7, in a hospital room, but able to interact with the nursing staff, which are very, as I think, they're very special at Children's. One was a girl named Tracy. We affectionately called her Crazy Tracy. Um, she brought in a bedpan full of snow, and she and Ava built a snowman. Uh, Child Life, which is a department which um, takes care of the children so that they feel at ease there. and. They used feathers and beads to decorate the snowman. It was really, really special. Ava wanted to take her to show and tell when she got back to kindergarten that year. Just really special moments of special people there. There was a number of families that were there, and a length of time, too, makes a difference. Um, the, the area, the wing that we were in, affectionately, was called 3F and it was kids with cystic fibrosis, kidney disease, and, and related um, challenges from kidney disease. There was a child there that had had a kidney transplant, but he was having stomach issues. There was a child there that had, had um, was diagnosed with kidney disease, and it had been caused by pneumonia that had gone to her kidneys. Um, there was another child there that had um, uh, something that had, I believe it was like a seizure or something that had affected her kidneys. She ended up being just fine, but you create those relationships. I usually hyperventilate and that causes headaches and migraines. in the morning. Sometimes you kind of feel paralyzed, like, like you could move, but you can't, because you just, you don't want to get out of bed. You don't want to, you don't want to do whatever it is that you're stressed about. So that, that's kind of 
sometimes a regular morning and the getting up early and the long appointments <laughs> in clinic don't always help with that stress level. It's, it's definitely a day-to-day -day thing, like I can't just predict that I'm going to not be feeling anxious. Tomorrow I could be or I could be completely fine. People say like deep breathing. I think for me it's kind of my cat <laughs> is a big kind of support and my friends when I'm at school if I'm too stressed if I'm in the office and I can't go anywhere they'll just come and get me and it kind of relieves all my anxiety. So uh, it was very interesting when we left uh, Eagle Ridge, or when we, at Eagle Ridge we had been told that we would likely be there for two to four days. So Rich had gone home as instructed and had gotten clothes for two to four days. Well, those two to four days stretched into eight, almost ten weeks. And so when we got to Children's Hospital, we didn't know how long we would be there, but after a week we thought, okay, well, let's make this a little bit more homey. And we had family that had a mini fridge, and we would go to the grocery store and we would get, you know, milk and yogurt. There was a few cupboards, and um, there was a cot in the room, and um, either uh, Rich or Dad or I would sleep on the cot, and the other one would sleep in the parent room, or we were lucky enough to have family close that every once in a while we would spend the night over there. A couple of memories that stick out of my head of our time at Children's, and I keep saying our because her dad and I were there with her, although we weren't getting all the pokes and all the surgeries, we were still part of the team, so to speak. And um, unusually one of my favorite um, moments is her room looked out on the helicopter pad um, at Children's and it was because it was right around Christmas time. It was all, there was lights, there was Christmas lights on all the houses close by and Christmas lights um, not on the helicopter pad but in that area and it was, it was beautiful. I mean you have to look at the silver lining on things. Um, we were also told um, to expect um, it to everything would be calm unless uh, nurses and doctors burst in. And so majority of the time, almost every night, we would have quiet nights and nobody would come in. And there was one night in the middle of the night where they burst in the door and there was nurses and doctors and so it was you know, stand down and, you know, as a parent, you just have to watch and, and hope and pray and that everything will be okay. And I believe her, um, I believe what had led to all the doctors and nurses coming in was um, some of her numbers had increased. And when um, things like potassium, in, in those levels increase, that can cause, um, uh, either damage or a challenge to the heart and I believe her numbers were that high that they were very concerned that that was going to cause a problem. Um, thankfully it didn't. They were able to um, work their magic and, and do a couple of uh, procedures and so everything worked out just fine and within a couple of hours it was as if, as if it didn't happen. But again the nurses there um, were absolutely amazing because they, you know, got Ava calm and relaxed and back to sleep. And they got me calm, relaxed, and back to sleep. Hey, honey, I lost the list for Jason's birthday thing. Obviously, hamburger cakes. <laughs> no, not hamburger cakes. Hamburgers and cake. <laughs> <laughs> and buns. Uh, sausage. Talking. Ooh, eye candy. Is it a full moon tonight? People are being weird.
And uh, don't forget to make the Facebook event private this time. Okay, bye. <gasps> Can you imagine losing most of something without realizing it? Over time, kidney disease can destroy up to 80% of kidney function before you notice any symptoms. Talk to your family doctor to see if you're at risk and need to be screened. It could save your life. on February 13th and so we went home after after February 13th and it was a very interesting and very kind of scary day I would assume it would be like skydiving that you don't know what to expect I would think it would be like having a new baby you come in the house and you need to make sure everything was clean and we had amazing friends that while she was in the hospital they cleaned her house all eight of them came in and they filled our fridge and they cleaned every single room in the house to kind of protect her from, from the two months of dust and dirt that would have accumulated. And um, so it was, it, that first night was a little scary. I'm not sure how much sleep I got, but you know, one day led into two days and um, she went back to school um, after about a month. Um, her principal came down and saw her during that time, a wonderful man, and um, she was in kindergarten at that time, and she was really supported by her friends. They, they were all little, probably didn't understand what was going on, but they knew that their friend was back. So a couple of them came to the house, and so when she came back to school, she was met with, where, where have you been, and we've missed you, and so it was, it was a good experience for her to go back to. She took it in all in stride. She was doing peritoneal dialysis um, every night. So she would have a normal day with her friends and play dates and, and such. And she at eight o'clock every evening uh, would get hooked up on peritoneal dialysis, be on it throughout the night and then be so to speak, unhooked from the PD unit in the morning and then carry on with her day. And that went on from, let's see, it went on from February until June. And then we were very, very, very blessed that her numbers had been improving during that time. And so they had made the decision to um, take her dialysis tube out. They stopped dialysis, the peritoneal dialysis in June, and they took the tube out in July. And um, she has been managed by medication since. We couldn't have known it then, but this would be the start of our long family journey towards kidney transplantation. Did you know one organ donor can save up to eight lives? You're more likely to need a transplant than you are to become an organ donor. Donation is considered only after all life-saving efforts are made, and it's certain you will not survive. So two physicians who are independent of both the donation program and of the transplant program must declare an individual neurologically dead before organ donation can proceed. Any British Columbian who is 19 or older can register their decision about organ donation, and parents can register their children. You only need to register your decision once. A decal on your driver's license or care card is no longer enough. Register or verify your decision about organ donation at transplant.bc.ca. And now you know. And now you know. And now you know. And now you know.